Great. Uh, thanks, Ms. Kitty, uh, for the uh, warm welcome introduction. Uh, uh, thank you, Bridge, for being here. And uh, thanks to Scott Geology Festival for inviting us and uh, having us here to talk to you guys today. Is my idea coming through okay, Katie? Just to double check. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Um, so there's a, I guess, not much really to add to the introduction. Um, I was actually at the University of Chicago in Mike's lab uh, doing a PhD until just earlier this year. Um, so uh, hence why I finally have a photo of myself that's uh, less than three years old. Um, but I also worked with uh, Tim Smithson at the University of Cambridge earlier in my sort of a paleontology career. So um, there's a bit of getting the band back together for this. So uh, yeah, largely we'll be talking about sort of the life and times and creatures that we find in rocks of Carboniferous Age in Scotland. So coal, I assume doesn't really need much of an introduction. It's really sort of like, you know, the literal fuel for the Industrial Revolution, particularly the British Isles. And, you know, the British Isles are particularly rich in coal deposits, you can see here on the right. Um, the red block- And can you speak up a bit? Yeah. Can you can speak you up a bit? Please. Is that better? Audio better? Yes, no? Let, okay, all right. A bit cool. better, yeah, good. Okay, so the red blotches over here you can see are uh, historical coal fields in the British Isles. You can see they're largely concentrated in sort of the Midlands of England and moving to the north, and in particular the Midland Valley of Scotland, which is incidentally where a lot of the rocks that we'll be talking about today come from. So a lot of these fossils were extracted beginning in the 19th century as people were mining coal. And because coal is essentially, you know, compressed plant matter remnants of these ancient swamp ecosystems, they were finding fossils. They were finding fish, insects, and, you know, other different kinds of vertebrates, in particular, what we call tetrapods. These are the four-limbed vertebrates. So this includes you, me, your dog, a snake, uh, a pigeon. Sort of, if you think of a land animal today, that's a vertebrate, it's a tetrapod. So, indeed, you know, this bears up in the naming. Um, one of the first of these animals to describe is literally called Anthracosaurus, coal lizard, uh, named by Huxley in 1863. So, during the Carboniferous period, the continents were coming together, starting to form Pangaea. And so at the equator, you had the formation of this really thick, really extensive, essentially rainforest belt around the equator and at the low latitudes, which persisted for you know, tens of millions of years, resulting in lots and lots of uh, coal formation. And indeed, uh, as going by the name, this is globally where we get most of our coal from. So uh, just a little bit of a prelude. So in the preceding period, the Devonian period, um, it ends actually with a mass extinction event, smaller than the one that killed the dinosaurs, but still pretty significant. Uh, you can see a pretty representative assemblage of late Devonian animals here on the left. We have uh, tetrapods, some large predatory fishes, uh, sea scorpion sort of truffling around for to try some plankton, as well as these archaic armored fishes, which are called placoderms. And so you can see here on the right, these are different fossil localities, and the colors correspond to different groups of animals. And you can see here, as we cross over from the Devonian in the sort of earthy orange and brown tones here on the left, into the Carboniferous on the right, we have a massive switchover in terms of what fossils we're finding. We don't find any of these placoderm groups, and really what we're seeing are ray-finned fishes, sharks and their relatives, and tetrapods, which have been the dominant vertebrate groups for the next 360 million years up until today. So, yeah, just kind of showing the, uh, the losers relative to the winners. So this is all great, this is all exciting, but as Katie alluded to, Right at the start of the Carboniferous period, right after this mass extinction, 
we've had what we call Romer's Gap. This is a time where fossils have been really rare. And this has been particularly frustrating because during this period, presumably, is when the recovery from the mass extinction happened. Lineages diversified, we got new species, especially because once the record resumes at about 340 to 335 million years ago, we have a whole staggering array of early tetrapods, fishes, all these other things, most of which we know about from Scotland. So the question is, what's happening essentially inside of this black box between point A and point B? So as I said, Scotland is one of two places in the world where we get rocks of the age to fit inside of Romer's Gap. Ironically, the other one is Nova Scotia in Canada. So here on the left is a map of localities that date back to this Romer's Gap period. One of these is Burnmouth. You can see a nice sunny shot of the harbor in the middle. And so Burnmouth and a bunch of these other localities were staked out by field work done by Stan Wood on the right and Tim Smithson, who's fortunately here today. Um, so a lot of this owes to sort of the really meticulous work in terms of essentially going out and doing you know really good field geology tracking. Where are we finding, say, these different lungfish tooth plates? What are they associated with? What rocks? You know, following things laterally. You know, lots of good work done there. And so. When we go into Romer's Gap, when we go to Burnmouth, what kind of fossils do we find? So kind of stepping through here on the left, we have some scraps, mainly scales and teeth of some of these really big predatory um, freshwater fishes that were swimming around at the time. We have lungfish tooth plates. And I'll just note that you can see a bunch of these here are 3D renders. So we actually don't find these sticking out of the rock. We actually came across them largely by accident um, by CT scanning uh, specimens. So essentially, you know, putting it through something like a CAT scan, but much higher resolution because of course we're looking at much smaller things. And so that's essentially opened up a whole new door for us in terms of getting information from rocks that we couldn't access before. We have bits from the fins and uh, the fins and chests of a uh, ratfish relative, as well as um, some more primitive uh, shark relatives over here. And then of course we have tetrapod bits, uh, quite a few tetrapod bits. They might not be much to look at, they're usually quite crushed and fragmentary, but we can still tell that we've got bits from the skull of one animal here on the left, uh, some more skull bones here on the top for a much larger animal. We've got bits of shoulder, we've got bits of leg, um, bits of hand or foot, bits of jaw. So between these, we have at least two different species, just from what I'm showing here on the screen. And then we have this animal, another completely accidental CT scan find. Um, we actually came across it because we put in some specimens of a lungfish in for CT scanning. And I think it was the Thursday before Easter, I was, you know, kind of working in the afternoon. And then Kat Smithson, who's our lab tech, sort of poked her head around the corner and said, you know, you'll want to come look at this. And so I think, oh, you know, we've CT scanned some more lungfish bits. And then she just shows me this on screen, <laughs> most of a tetrapod face, just we had no idea it was there. Um, which is, you know, really cool. So it's a, so here, um, and from there we can start to reconstruct the biota. Again, we have at least two kinds of tetrapods, possibly more. We have several different kinds of fishes as well, kind of all living together in this environment at this time. So this is really interesting because the tetrapods that we're finding at Burnmouth inside of Romer's Gap, a lot of them represent lineages and groups that we actually previously knew from later on in the Carboniferous. So uh, this, uh, the, the CT scan uh, tetrapod face that I mentioned earlier is part of this group called the Colossidids that show up about 10, 15 million years later. Um, 
And so this represents a pretty big range extension for multiple different kinds of tetrapods down into the very earliest part of the Carboniferous, implying that at the very least, they're getting off the ground very early after the mass extinction. So now we can start to fill in some of the progression from the late Devonian into Weber's Gap and then into sort of the post Weber's Gap part of the Carboniferous when it seems like sort of contrary to some of our expectations, life in general is doing pretty well, going pretty strong. So Burnmouth is just one of these localities, excuse me, in, in sort of the border region of Scotland at the Scottish Midland Valley that belonged to what we call Paleo Lake Cadell. So this was a large extensive lake that was persistent for at least several million years. And so from this period, we get a whole bunch of different tetrapod localities, mostly centered around Edinburgh and then near Glasgow. And so this is a selection of some of the animals that we find. We find large millipedes, sea scorpions, different kinds of fishes, and then, of course, a whole bunch of tetrapods. And in fact, inside this tetrapod assemblage, we find some of the earliest members of the lineages that lead to modern tetrapods today. So one way to think of it is the last common ancestor that you have with a frog is bumping around somewhere here at about 335, 340 million years ago. So now I will hand it over to Tim, who will talk about um, some of these sort of more biological uh, investigations that we've been doing in terms of how these animals lived their lives. So I will mute myself and Tim, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Right, I'm going to talk about um, a couple of sites that Stan Wood discovered uh, in the, the last century. Um, 2000, uh, 1975 and 1985. Stan, as many of I'm sure you will know, uh, was probably the, the, the greatest Scottish fossil collector there has ever been. Uh, he died, sadly, uh, in 2012, but his legacy is enormous, and we will probably be working on Stan's fossils for many, many years to come. Next slide. These are Stan's principal fossil sites. And as you can see, many of them sit within the Central Valley between Edinburgh and Glasgow, but there are a number of them down in the borders area. You can see Willie's Hole and Fulden these are part of the deposits that form part of Roma's Gap. And just to the east of Fulden is um, Burnmouth. Sites down the, the border there. But what I'm going to be talking about are the first two tetrapod sites that Stan found. The first of them was at Dora, uh, near Cowden Beath in Fife. And the other one was at East Kirkton between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Next slide, please. Now, this is the Dora open cast coal mine. A bit grim, as you can see. These are photographs taken in the autumn of 1975. Stan discovered uh, vertebrate fossils at this locality in 1974, but it wasn't until the, the operators of the open cast site uncovered the beds that he discovered that he was able to get down and do the collecting. You can see on the top slide, this big area that had been uncovered. Uh, to the right, there's an area that looks a little bit like a tennis court. Well, that area is where on the bottom picture, Stan on the left and Alec Panshin, my PhD supervisor, and Mike's PhD supervisor were collecting in November 1975. Next slide, please. This is probably the most important specimen 
that Stan discovered at uh, Dora. It's a thing, as you can see, called Crassigerinus scoticus. What we see here is an animal that is presenting sort of belly up. On the right hand side are its lower jaws. It then sweeps round, you can see ribs and so on, to essentially its pelvis. So we've got pretty much all of the skeleton bar the tail. That is well over a meter long. So when you think about the whole, whole animal, it will probably be in an excess of two meters long. Next slide. This is the hind leg of Crassigerinus with bits of its pelvis. The pelvis is at the, the top right and the lower limb bones are next to it. You've got a femur, a tibia and a fibula there. This is from a different specimen to the one that I showed you earlier, but nevertheless, it gives us a lot of information about the hind leg of Crassidurinus. Next slide, please. Alec and I described these bones back in 1990, and we were puzzled by one or two features that we'd never ever seen before in early tetrapods. And these are labeled here as protuberance. So there's one at the bottom end of the femur, that's on the, the, the top picture, but there's also one at the, the top end, the proximal end of the tibia. Now we didn't know what these things were. We described them as best we could. We noticed that they were unique, but we had to leave it there. We, there was no way of us telling what was going on. They certainly didn't seem to be part of the typical morphology of the hind limb of these early tetrapods. So the next slide. So that was 1990. 25 years later, a PhD student came along and wanted to do some more work on Crassigerinus. This was Eva Herbst. And she was able to use the CT scanners and start looking at the histology of this bone. Here we have the, the femur again. And what she was able to do essentially was take slices through it and look at the protuberance, which she has labeled there, PR. If we go to the next slide, please. This is the tibia. And again, we see this protuberance and you can see it as a bump on the side of the, the tibia. It's quite different to the typical morphology. It looks separate. So what this led um, Eva to suggest was that what we were seeing was evidence of bone healing. And this is one of the very first examples of bone healing in early tetrapods. So by using modern techniques with fossils that were collected a very long time ago, we're getting more evidence about what these animals were doing. And in this case, there's evidence that they were able to heal their bones from injury. We go to the next slide. This is just showing where East Kirkton is. And the next one. Next slide, please. Right, here we are 10 years after Dora in East Kirkton Quarry in West Lothian in 1985. And on the left, there's a, a group of people who were going to work on the specimens that Stan was beginning to find. Stan is there on the left-hand side of the group. He always seemed to go to these group meetings very well dressed for somebody going into a quarry, but nevertheless. And there you see him in the quarry with his hammers and crowbars and all the rest of it. And one of the things that characterizes Stan's fieldwork 
is it was always large scale. If it was going to dig a hole, it would always be a big one. So let's go to the next slide. Stan announced his discoveries at East Kirkton in March 1985 in the International Journal Nature. And it was a cover story. And you can see a specimen there in part and counterpart uh, as the front cover. Next slide, please. Now, this is a specimen that Stan donated to the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. He didn't quite know what to do with it. It was collected before 1994 when he stopped working at East Kirkton Quarry, but it wasn't prepared until 2012. And then it was described by myself and Jenny Clack and Marcello Rutter in 2022. So if we go to the next slide, you will see it prepared. And what we have here are bones of the, the hind leg and girdle. And the next slide is a drawing. And there you go, you've got the right and left pelvis, you've got the left femur, the left tibia and fibula, and bones of the left foot. And what we were particularly interested in was the foot. So the next slide shows us the arrangements of the bones of the, the leg, the femur, the tibia, and the fibula, and then the bones of the foot. And what we try to do with the dotty lines there is to work out which of the bones belong to which of the toes. Pretty much all of the skeleton is there, and that allowed us to do a reconstruction, which is the next slide. And there it is. As you can see, there weren't many gaps in our understanding. And what we prepared as a reconstruction was an animal which had a very long fourth digit. Now, this was particularly unusual. We'd not seen anything like that before. Let's go to the next slide. What we see in the modern fauna is the same kind of arrangement in lizards. And this is a photograph of a zebra-tailed lizard from Arizona. And you can see there a very long fourth digit. Now, Terminerpeton, this animal that we named, is not a lizard, it's not even a reptile, but it might well be on amongst the group from which the reptiles eventually descended. But it had this elongate fourth digit, and like the zebra-tailed lizard, it might well have been used to increase its stride length and speed during terrestrial locomotion. This is critical to understanding the East Kirkton Quarry because pretty much everything that Stan discovered there was terrestrial. We don't fully understand why, but there it goes. The next slide, please, shows Terminerpeton as the last one, G, on the top line of reconstructed feet. And you can see, I hope, that the fourth digit is by far longer than any other. C is the closest, that's a thing called Eldision. But even there, if you look at it closely, you can see that the fourth digit is much, much longer than the rest. The ones below are other examples of feet in early tetrapods. And the one that's closest to it is N, and that is a late Carboniferous reptile, Petrolacosaurus, that also has this very long digit. My final slide, Ben, please. Are just some examples of other tetrapods collected by Stan from the East Kirkton Quarry. 
And one of the things that stands out is the preservation of their hind feet. So many of them have got very well preserved hind feet. Valinurpeton, which was on the front cover of Nature, Sylvanurpeton, Westlow, the Arna, Kirktonecta, Eucrita, and Eldision. The one that hasn't got well preserved feet is the last one, Ophidurpeton. That is a snake like early tetrapod, and it's got no limbs at all, but it was found at East Kirkton Quarry. So there's a great diversity of animals living at the quarry that we see there. That's me finished. Thank you, Ben. I'll pass back to you now. Thanks, Tim. Now I will stop my share and hand it over to Mike for his bit. Hello. Right. I will attempt to seamlessly segue or something into my display. There we go. This looks like it's going to work. If I can find my cursor, switching between screens, going... OK, have I got the right display on screen? Yep. OK, right. So a, a creel of sharks. I'm going to be talking about fish um, and in particular talking about sharks. Um, an earlier title for this brief summary was Cradle of Sharks. It's the Scottish Midland Valley, the cradle of modern cartilaginous fishes. Well, a brief bit of context to get started. The extinction which Ben told you about, by the way, am I loud enough? I look for Tim to nod at me or something. OK, yes. good. Uh, that extinction really marks the root of the modern vertebrate biota. If you were down in the Devonian, you would be appalled by some of the things you saw. After the Devonian, they might be a bit strange, but they'd seem strangely familiar because it would be rafe in fishes, sort of ancestors of goldfish and you know, tunas and mackerel and things in the seas and the lakes. And on land, you would see the earliest tetrapods that you've just heard about. And then there were sharks. So those are the vertebrates which are dominating the ecosystem. So we know the roots of these groups go much deeper, but their abundance and their diversity takes off in the aftermath of the end of onion extinction. And somewhere within this strange period, the the period that we've got a really poor record of, Roma's gap. And the question is, what does that gap signify? But I'm talking about sharks, so I'll keep going on this thing now. So just a reminder, for those of you who suffered sharks before, this will be a repeat, but just are there distinctive features about sharks? Yes, they've all got multiple gill slits instead of a single gill flap. They have tiny scales not big scales, they have tiny scales that grow once and you know they might be damaged, et cetera, and regrow, but they don't grow through life. They have these well-known sort of teeth-like escalator systems, serial replacement, a mouthful of lots of teeth, really high turnover rate in modern sharks, replacing teeth within a couple of weeks, if only we could do that in old age. Um, <laughs> cartilaginous skeleton, it's mineralized, it has a a layer of little calcified tiles around it, but it's predominantly cartilaginous, unlike our own. And their reproductive mode, the lurid picture at the bottom of the screen there, there's a couple of sharks caught in, flagra in flagranti. But the, the point is, if it's internal reproduction, internal fertilization, it's low numbers. You're not going to get millions of eggs and millions of fish fry coming from sharks. It's just a few. And some of them have even go the full hog, they even get tiger sharks today with placentation. So there's a lot of investment in a few young. So just some reminders about basic shark biology. So sharks today, there's only about total 1,100 species. That's nothing compared to rafe in fishes. Most rafe in fish, you see, if you go to your local aquarium shop or, you know, a display aquarium, etc., a teleos, 30,000 species of those. So we're only talking you know, a 30th of the diversity of teleosts, and that's all cartilaginous fishes. Most of those are, in fact, skates and rays. The more kind of media friendly, if you like, you know, great whites and things like that, we're down to around 500 species in total. There's one other group 
to tell you about, the ones you've probably never heard of. These are the chimeras, 57 species and counting. They're weird. They're so obscure, they don't really have a stable common name. They're known as ratfish or ghost sharks or rabbit fish or elephant sharks. They have highly specialized teeth. And crucially, they live in deep water. They're all down to some extreme depths, down to about, you know, almost three kilometers in depth. OK, so uh, you're not un you're pretty unlikely to see one sort of turning up in Burnmouth Harbour, or at least not a living one. Um, what's the fossil record of sharks like? It's awful. If you go to a museum, you want to study early sharks, especially carboniferous ones, you'll see drawers and drawers full of specimen boxes like this with little isolated teeth because they rot, they disintegrate. And all you get is a little cache of its dentition that's scattered. So poor quality record. And this is where Scotland delivers the goods. It's one of the few places on the planets where we have a few localities where we get articulated early shark bodies. And it's quite remarkable that there are two, three, four localities in the Scottish Midland Valley and the Borders area where these fossils turn up again. And surprise, surprise, Stan Wood has had a major part in this. The localities have already been shown on screen. So I'm just going to try and tell you about a few examples today and what insights they give us into the early radiation of modern sharks. And the first one I'll tell you about is uh, possibly the most famous of the lot, the Bearsden shark, again discovered by Stan Wood in a suburb of Glasgow, while taking his dog for a walk, in a suburb where lots of members of the geology department of the University of Glasgow at that time were living. So Stan finds black shale deposit, deltaic deposit, underlies a lot of Western Glasgow, etc. Still fossils are being found from there by other collectors, but he finds this particular shark, and it is quite exquisite. This is truly exceptional preservation for an early shark. It lay down and died in stagnant black shales. So this photograph was taken by Keith Ingham at the Hunterian Museum, University of Glasgow, and it's immersed in solvents, which is why it doesn't look like black shale, but it gives you greater enhancement of the cartilage, uh, black and yellow against the surrounding sediment. And just a few features I want to point out about this, this weird beast. First of all, it's, a, it's around about a meter long. So it's only about the size of a, a dogfish, okay? Um, it's, it's got a tail like you'd find on the back end of a tuna fish. It's a high aspect ratio tail for driving a fish fairly fast through the water. But it's got a backbone. Backbone, well, there's no bone in this because it's a shark. It's got a really rudimentary axial skeleton, spinal column, if you like, which is really no more sophisticated than you find today in one of the few remaining jawless fishes today, a lamprey, which implies it was really flexible but if it gave a real whip to the tail at the back, it would drive a sine wave up the body. So I think this is a slow cruiser rather than high speed fish. Um, so flexible, it's got claspers coming off the pelvic fins at the back, um, it's a little red arrow pointing upwards there. So it's this is a male and it must have internal fertilization is there in this early shark. And it's got this weird structure on its back, this, this anvil. The, the formal name for this shark is Acmanistian, which means anvil sail. But it looks like an ironing board, and it's covered in these huge prong-like teeth. So it's a sort of Dardarist ironing board. Um, and the function still isn't clear. I should say we did do one rudimentary hydrodynamic biomechanical test of this to find out how expensive it would be for a shark to have one of these. We built a model and we towed it through a flow tank and it's pretty cheap. And it did have some weird vortices coming off the back of it. So perhaps a plume of scent or something like that, or is it defense? Is it display? Is it unique to males? I would suggest probably not. There's stuff in the literature suggesting they are, but I'm not convinced. So that's still a mystery, but it's rigid. It's built of actually rather bone-like calcified tissue, but it's one of the strange things that occurs in this group of early sharks 
And this is not unique. There are many disarticulated, less well-preserved specimens like this known from elsewhere. So to answer what kind of shark this was or is, what's it related to? CT scanning comes in again. CT scanning is having a huge impact on our field of study because it's unlocking a wealth of new data. So this potato-like nodule we discovered contains the skull of a very, very near relative of the Bearsden shark. OK, it would be almost like good old British Leyland cars and their bin parts design. You could take the head of this shark and dump it on that one. And this is what we happen when we CT scan it. So here's a movie. Hopefully this will work. So there's the skull of a 330 million year old shark rotating. We'll take it for a spin. So it doesn't have the jaws attached. They're separate. So you can see huge orbits. You can see the nostrils, see the back. And now we'll open it up and we can see the anatomy inside. And we can see its ear canals and we can see the shape the space occupied by the brain and the tracts of some of the major cranial nerves. What this tells us is that on the outside, it's a shark, but inside, it's a chimera. This is really strong signature. There's a lot of weirdness about chimera internal anatomy. So this means this shark and all its many relatives are early chimeras. These sharks bear the same relation to the modern chimeras that if you like, dinosaurs are now known to relate to modern birds. The term I would use is stem group birds. So dinosaurs are stem group birds. They're early birds. They don't look like birds. Things change. But what this tells us is that in these early Carboniferous oceans and throughout the lower part of the Carboniferous, the seas were ruled by chimera relatives in a huge abundance. They're really diverse. And some of them have crushing teeth, and some of them have piercing teeth, and some of them look like billfish, some of them look like flying fish. They're spectacular in their diversity. So, pretty amazing. They're diverse, many different kinds of taxa, and they're anatomically disparate. They're very different shapes. So they're occupying a huge, huge space. All of which begs questions, what happened to change this? Because it's a very different mix today. Remember the numbers I told you? 57 species of chimera alive today versus 1,100-odd of sharks. Now, the clue about what happened may be up in the corner of my slide there where I've got little clownfish sticking up. Was it the rise of the rayfin fishes that displaced them? In which case, what kind of key innovation did they have? What adaptation allowed them? Was it their reproductive biology? Did they just spawn massively? Is it something to do with their mouth parts because they're way more sophisticated in the way they feed with suction feeding? It's not clear. I can't give you a nice pat answer. But what's clear is that, look at that graph again. In a sense, you could look at that with a time axis across the bottom, that the early relatives of the chimeras, in a sense, got kicked off the shallow margins of the continents and into deep water. It's a sort of refugium for these relics of earlier groups. So meanwhile, what's going on with the, the root of the modern, if you like, true sharks, the elasmobranchs, the skates, rays, and the sharks you're more familiar with? They must have been around at the same time. So again, we're talking about calibrating the tree of life, putting that split back by 330, 340, in fact, deeper million years ago, deep split. So I'll tell you about a couple of sharks from a couple of other sites. First one I'll throw up <coughs> is a thing called Onychosalaki. That's from both sites marked on here. It's both known in the borders <coughs> and up around um, Edinburgh, Wardy, Granton Harbour. And the amazing thing about this is one of the earliest members we find is already specialised. It's this charming little walking shark. It's about the size of a shark pup today. It's only about 20 centimetres long. And the remarkable thing about this is it's got specialized large paddle-like fins. <clears throat> and we know from the internal anatomy that these are like modern epaulette sharks. You can go and look these up on YouTube in your own time. They're amazing things. They'll go for a walk on the foreshore. So it's not only tetrapods 
experimenting with getting out of the depths and exploiting the marginal habitats. Sharks were doing it then, just as some sharks are doing it now. They can take a mouthful of seawater and they can tolerate the oxygen stress. And in fact, a lot of other stresses you're putting your body through physiologically, being exposed in actually quite warm, shallow conditions. Rock pools are harsh environments. And things like epaulette sharks and bamboo sharks can cope with that. So they can go rock pool to rock pool foraging. But they're not the first ones to do it. You've got this little early twig on the stem leading to modern true sharks and rays. Onoko Salaki is doing it back then at the margins of the coal swamps. <clears throat> and now I'll tell you about another example, another anachronistic, if you like, shark when you see it. There's a thing called Tristichius. This is from Wardy Beach, just around the corner from Morrison's supermarket and the museum stores. So, and there's more of it there. So it's an ironstone nodule. Formerly, that ironstone was used for making iron. How many sharks ended up in Napoleonic armaments is another question. Another story there about the exploitation of the, the minerals, etc. But CT scans have given us, again, exceptional information about the anatomy of this early dogfish. Again, not terribly big, originally worked on by another member of the pension lab, just like Tim Smith and myself, John Dick. I went back to this material, CT scanned it, more of Stan's specimens, and you can see we got it in three dimensions. And we've got the gills and the jaws and brain case. And what's important about it? Well, I'll show you, you know, this is reconstruction made easy. Um, so you'll see here a nodule, and now you'll see the kind of slices we get through it, showing the cartilage surrounded by the ironstone. Never normally get to this cartilage. And there's that specimen rendered. And now we'll rotate it. And we have many specimens of this shark. And uh, we'll add in the other detail with its jaws and cartilages in its lips. So here's a, a really quite credible reconstruction of Tristichius, looking less than mean and intimidating. Um, because it's very like modern nurse sharks. And there's a bamboo shark comparison from today, side by side with it. This, crucially, is a suction feeding shark. It's doing what teleos fishes have had great claims about they're so sophisticated what they're able to do. They don't do this until some 50 million years later, the earliest evidence of a an early raven fish suction feeding. And the point is, we were able to model this both computationally and physically because of the quality of the material that we can get from CT scanning. So we can constrain the joints on the shark, okay? We can model sliding joints and hinges and where ligaments are going and where there are simple hinges versus 3D, uh, 3D rotational joints. This allowed us to really get to grips with this and. Uh, calculate volumetric changes to the jaws, et cetera, degrees of freedom, the amount of movement. And it's what we call an enhanced suction feeder. It's not simply opening its mouth underwater, it's actually pumping, sucking water in. This is the first vertebrate we have evidence of doing this. But again, this was really thought to be a Mesozoic, not a Paleozoic phenomenon, because it really changes life for elusive prey, like swarms of juvenile larval fishes, shrimps, or invertebrates living in the sediment. So this gives us yet more insight into the paleoecology and how these fishes are fitting into this system. But again, the kind of analysis we would never have expected to be able to do with a fossil shark of all things until you know five years ago when we started on this route and just thought, how far can we push these data? So again, you know, what I've hoped to have just given you very, very briefly here is three snapshots of shark life from 330 million years ago, demonstrating that, yeah, you know, in one sense, they're bizarre, but they're also specialized. They're advanced. They're unexpectedly sophisticated. Show you again the way that you've seen from Tim Smithson's work that the impact of CT technology is unlocking a hell of a lot of new data. We're getting a clearer idea of biodiversity, the roots of modern groups, 
And it's helping us, and this is a really crucial thing, calibrate the tree of life. It's what we get the big supporting money to do. Um, so I have to say thanks to past and present lab members, including Ben. And there's Stan again, discover, uh, discoverer of many of the specimens that I've just shown you. His impact just runs and runs. And again, just to emphasize, you can't go many places on the planet and find this quality data. Okay, so that's me finished. Thank you.